Good evening, everyone. Today we have a different topic to discuss on, and it's about parietally impacted canines. Perspectives and biomechanics with TADS. Now we are basically going to discuss about some complicated impactions and a case of transmigration of canine. We need to understand that when we talk about impacted canines, it is one of the toughest things to be treated in orthodontics. Basically impacted teeth would test your uh, credibility as an orthodontist. And therefore this case uh, is uh, one of the cases that we would love to discuss with you uh, to discuss about various paradigms uh, and the protocols and methods of treating palatally impacted canines. Now, this is a patient who comes to us uh, at 23 years of age, and you can understand as the age progresses, uh, impactions are difficult to get corrected. Most of the uh, impacted canines tend to have uh, ankylosis, uh, but yet it needs to be tried upon. Uh, she's a female and she complains of teeth stuck within the jaw, uh, with associated irregularity of teeth. She did not have any other medical problems. She is also concerned about the fact that she doesn't have an, an aesthetic smile. Basically, she had deciduous teeth uh, bilaterally in the maxillary arch in the canine region. And uh, that was uh, uh, what she was telling that was spoiling her smile. As we can see that we have bilateral impactions of canine in her case. Also, uh, she had a transmigrated canine in the lower arch. Now we're going to discuss about the transmigrated canine also. As usual protocols, we took uh, uh, the extra oral views uh, photographs. Uh, we showed that she had a perfectly symmetrical face. Uh, she never had a problem with her facial pattern or, uh, or any uh, profile issues. Uh, she was concerned about her smile uh, because she felt that uh, they are anesthetic. She had spacing of the anterior teeth. Uh, and that anesthetic smile was basically because she had multiple deciduous teeth in the upper arch. When you looked at the 45 degree view, we came to know that yes, there is uh, a lot of things that can done, uh, be done to improve her smile. Uh, but she had uh, a very good orthogonal facial profile uh, in her case. Uh, except for a bit of extra chin prominence, uh, which she had basically due to a mild class three skeletal base. Now, uh, interval photographs suggested uh, that she had deep overbite, overbite uh, which was uh, which needed to be corrected because of functional reasons. She also had a transmigrated canine in the four three. Uh, she had uh, the bilateral deciduous canines uh, with impacted. Uh, one, three, and two, three, uh, they basically. So uh, we had bilateral impactions of canines. So we have a deep bite and we have also have a transmigrated canine. Uh, these are tough cases uh, to be treated okay? because at 23, uh, if you want to de-impact canine, uh, basically that itself is quite a challenge. So when we looked at the occlusal view, we knew that there was a partial impaction uh, of the upper right canine. Uh, but there was a parietal bulge uh, in the upper left canine. The problem with the upper left canine uh, was that it was uh, it was an intraosseous uh, impaction. Also that uh, the crown of the canine was very close to the root of the central and the lateral incisor. The problem with such canines is that when we try to move the canines by conventional mechanics, you tend to get a root resorption because of the crown of the canine touching the roots uh, of the lateral and the central incisor. Now that's a challenge which needs to be uh, needs to be attended to. In the lower heart, she had crowding in the lower anterior teeth, apart from the fact that her she had congenitally missing three sevens. So the, up, uh, the, the lower left second molar was impacted. When you looked at the OPG, the things became very clear. Uh, and we understood that it was a complicated impaction, which was very close to the midline. And as Erickson and Crowe suggest that the closer it is to the midline and uh, the angulation with respect to the occlusal plane uh, determines the prognosis uh, of uh, correction of impacted teeth. He also had a partially impacted canine in 1-3, but that uh, was solvable. Now we need to uh, also see that she had a transmigrated canine. Okay. That's a 4-3, which has migrated uh, very close to the 3 3. So, we need to see whether we want to correct it or not. Also, we want to pass on that uh, she had also visited an orthodontist in the past 
uh, and he uh, he had told that we will be able to save only one teeth, which is one three. Uh, the rest two teeth are not possible uh, to be uh, corrected because of the age, because of the complexity of the impaction and that if we try to move the two, three, likely there would be a compromise uh, in the future of uh, uh, two, one and two, two. Uh, that's the central and the lateral incisor because by conventional mechanics is going to hit the root and you might get root disruption and other things. So uh, she tried it, uh, uh, she uh, wanted to save both the canines in the upper arch. She was not very concerned about the lower arch because uh, she was more to, it was more to do with aesthetics and she wanted to, everything in the upper arch to look natural. So when she opted for us, uh, we told that we are going to give it a try because we have to use uh, uh, the, uh, mini, mini screw assisted uh, de-impaction of canine in this case in order to avoid uh, the, the problems associated with conventional uh, canine de-impaction. Now, uh, before we uh, go into everything, uh, it is important to diagnose this case well and understand how complex is this canine impaction. Now, if you want to know, uh, for, this is, uh, for all postgraduate students, if you want to know details about radiographic assessment of maxillary canine eruption in children and clinical signs and symptoms, this article by Erickson and Kroll is probably a landmark article which came out in 1986 in the European Journal of Orthodontics. So uh, the, what does it basically uh, talk about? Uh, it basically talk, talks about the localization of the canine and how, uh, what's the prognosis of the canine in this future. So we look at this canine, we understand uh, uh, that uh, it is uh, uh, very, very close to the midline. Uh, that's overlapping the roots of the lateral incisor. And uh, uh, the, the fact uh, that it is uh, quite angulated with respect to the midline and the occlusal plane, uh, and how difficult was it? The distance from the occlusal plane to the two, three was 11 millimeters. That's very deep seated canine. Angulation to the midline is about 35 degrees, which is also very complicated. So if you go through uh, uh, the rules and regulations which you put forth in the article, you, you really want to uh, basically uh, extract that canine because the prognosis of that canine is poor. But with recent trends in orthodontics and recent uh, 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 the armamentarium which are available, it is uh, it's very easy to correct them. Now, if you want to know about uh, the angulation of the canine, their prognosis, the bone support, uh, and to assess impacted canines, this article by Erickson and Kurol, which came out in 1987 on radiographic assessment of ectopically erupting maxillary canine, is probably the best article article that uh, you could read. It. Uh, there is one more article by Jacobs on radiographic localization of unerupted teeth for their findings about the vertical tube shift technique, which all clinicians and all postgraduates should know about, uh, which came out in the American Journal of Orthodontics in 2000, uh, is a must read article. But with the advent of CBCT and, uh, able, uh, and 3D planning systems, uh, the things have become much, much easier for all clinicians. Since it was a very complicated case and that uh, the proximity of the roots uh, of the central and the lateral to the crown of the, of the canine uh, uh, was very evident, we went ahead and took a CBCT, which, uh, which suggested that okay, for, uh, for one three region, it was pretty favorable, but the two three impacted canine was almost overlapping and touching the roots of, of the lateral and the central incisors. So the first thing that we need to do is, is that before performing any heroics or bringing down the canine, we should see that whatever tooth is associated uh, with this impacted canine needs to be preserved because they have good pedantry. And then we need to see whether this third uh, uh, teeth can be brought into line or not. Now, uh, when we talk uh, about uh, any orthodontic case, we tend to do uh, cephalometry, uh, but cephalometry is not too important in this case because we are not planning to retract uh, the the incisors uh, much or change uh, the profile of the patient. Uh, that's because the patient had come purely for aesthetic reasons and that for the fact that the canines were impacted. However, we went ahead and uh, did the number analysis. Uh, and when we traced it over the, over the, uh, over the face uh, and other parameters, we came to know it's a class three skeletal base. So the numbers uh, show uh, uh, that it's a class three skeletal base because the NB is zero degree. We have an increased IMPA. We have mild proclination of the upper and the lower incisors. We have a deep overbite. That's, that needs to be corrected because that's very important to, uh, uh, for functional reasons. Uh, and basically uh, she, is a, uh, she is quite a horizontal grower. 
Now, what is the inference is classic skeletal pattern, horizontal growth pattern, procline upward incisors, procline lower incisors, uh, balanced facial profile, basically. So uh, uh, this is uh, the one thing which we need to uh, correct uh, the, the deep bite and, and other aspects uh, of the face. But uh, the, if the main criteria for this case is to correct the, the impacted canines. Now, wh what is the role of the TADS and the skeletal anchor assistance in the treatment of impacted canine? If you want to know uh, in details, this review by, uh, the, by Stella Chosu and Gabriel Chosu, and we need to understand that uh, Becker and Chosu has done excellent work on de impactions uh, of teeth and canine over the years. And this review uh, of uh, literature, which came out in seminars in Ottawa in 2010, is probably the best read that you could have on this article. So what is the purpose of TADS in the correction of canine impaction? Why is auxiliary mechanics becoming so very important? There are four uh, points which came out of this article. One is, if you use TADS, uh, it helps to avoid root disruption of adjacent teeth during the movement of impacted teeth because you are having three-dimensional control over the impacted teeth, basically. You have shorter treatment time uh, when compared to conventional mechanics. Helps in anchorage preservation of the posterior teeth because there is taxation of anchorage when we try to correct impacted teeth because they have to undergo a long course uh, of uh, on long path of eruption. Uh, they can act as direct anchorage unit for use of auxiliary mechanics uh, like ballista spring. So you can have an IZC or a TAD attached to a ballista spring uh, directly rather than taking support from the teeth. Now, these are the four important points that we need to remember as to why TADs are very important in, in correction of any form of impactions. There is one more article which, uh, and, uh, which suggests the same thing, which came out in Dental Press uh, Journal. Uh, and this article was by Hiravi and Shafi. They also said that when they compared it with the com control group okay, uh, in which conventional mechanics was used to de-impact uh, uh, palatally impacted canines and where TADs is used, uh, they found out that the single most factor uh, uh, which, uh, uh, the, which was significantly different in both the groups was that the chances of root resorption of the adjacent teeth in the TAD group was far lesser. So you have to understand that if you're using TADs, there are high chances that you don't meddle with the other tooth already in the arch. That's a great uh, advantage, basically. So your auxiliary mechanics is probably the way forward to the future when it comes to complicated uh, tooth movements. So what is our treatment plan in this case? Our treatment plan in this case is that we want to bring down the impacted canine. First, we want to dislice the impacted canine. That's very important because the crown of the canine is already touching the root of the central and the lateral incisor. So, so what? Uh, article we want to quote for this is that uh, you can use this article by Fournier on orthodontic considerations in the treatment of maxillary impacted canine that came back way back in the American Journal of Orthodontics in 1982. But the two points that came out of that article was that first you need to create enough space in the arch for the canine to come down. That's the one more. You don't start moving the canine on day one. You want to have enough space in the arch uh, for it to come down. Number two is that, okay, you need to uh, overcome all the interferences in its course of eruption. So if the lateral incisor and the central incisor root uh, is touching the canine, you need to take care that the canine uh, is moved away from, from the root so that these interferences uh, don't bother with the eruptive movements of the canine, okay, when you are doing the impaction. So what did we do in this case? We placed a TAD, okay, we want to use auxiliary mechanics uh, in the palate uh, and then did an uh, uh, open window method to place up a bracket uh, or a, a button basically and give a traction so that it gives a distal movement to the canine and also helps in uprighting the canine also. So once that is done for a significant amount of time, uh, uh, then what we do is that uh, now we bracket up the, the anterior teeth here we want to make a very important point is that when your base archware, you should keep it round because if you are using the MBT system, what happens is that with a plus 22 degree torque and if you are having a rectangular or a very thick base archware, the torque tends to get expressed uh, uh, and once the torque tends to get expressed, the root tends to move much more lingually or palatally and then it goes and hits 
the crown of the uh, of the canine. Once it hits the crown of the canine, you will get root resorption. So either you use a variable uh, torque uh, in this case where you have low torque, or if you want to use the conventional system, make it a point that you have not gone to a rectangular archway when you are bringing about these forms of movement, because you really don't want the roots of the lateral and the central incisors to, to crash into the canine, uh, just because you have extra torque in your brackets and you have put a rectangular archway in a rectangular slot. That's one very important point that you need to remember. We are fond of auxiliary mechanics. So when we displace the canine, okay, uh, we used a, a inverted loop or a, or, or a modified baluster spring uh, to, uh, to activate uh, it. And once we activated it, uh, we, uh, we tend to upright it and tie it to the canine. And the net movement is uh, after the canine has been displaced a bit is downward and outward. So uh, that is the amount, uh, the type of the movement which you want in case of a palatally impacted canine. So my auxiliary artwear in this case is a 014 SS Australian artwear. So that's what happens, okay, when I bring uh, back the canine uh, and slowly and surely it comes uh, down into line. Now there are umpty lot of methods. This was one of the methods which we are using, but there are umpty lot of methods in literature. One of the most prominent ones uh, came out uh, uh, from, uh, the Dr. Adit Venugopal and our very own uh, Dr. Niklesh Ved, uh, which talks about intra-arch uh, traction strategy for palatal cuspid, uh, uh, cuspid uh, impactions. And it came out in the Journal of Contemporary uh, Dental Practice in 2020, where they used a mini screw in the lower arch and gave a traction uh, of elastic uh, to a modified hook placed in the canine in the upper arch. Now that's, uh, and that's another good method to be done so long as you have good amount of patient compliance. And uh, also uh, this uh, intra-arch me mechanics will have a good amount of exclusive force also to bring back the canine. So we have different methods, uh, whichever works well for you is, uh, and you get uh, good clinical results out of it is all that you want. We, uh, there are also articles uh, which came out from Harabi and Shafi, which talks about forced eruption of palatally impacted canines using bracket head mini screws uh, placed in the, in, the, in the palate and use of auxiliary mechanics or springs from the, from the bracket head screws. Now that came out in JCO in 2014. Now, uh, so uh, we will have a lot of articles and ideas about canine impaction because this has one uh, been a topic of interest for years because movement of uh, impacted canines and bringing them into right place, putting them into good area of cancellous bone and allow, giving them an opportunity to, uh, uh, for the rest of its life to survive well is probably the best thing uh, that, that, a, uh, that a skilled orthodontist can actually do. So what happens after the canine has come into place? The biggest problem that we face while the canine has come into the arch is that the root is lying in the palatal area while the crown has come out buckly. Now, there are different methods to correct it. The one of the commonest method uh, uh, to, uh, to correct this, uh, this form is to use a minus seven degree torque bracket. Now in this, there are lots of torque options. First of all, your premolar bracket in the upper arch is also minus seven degrees. So you can place a minus seven degree bracket in the canine also. Uh, what, uh, what does it happen when you have a minus seven degree bracket? Basically, you are gaining negative torque in a palatally impacted canine with upper premolar brackets, which means that your canine root, which is placed more palatally, is going to come out more buckly. Unless and until you put the canine root into the right place, you're going to get relapse. Also, the smile aesthetics will never come uh, good. You need to get a good prominence of the root of the canine in your buccal vestibule, okay, to have good soft tissue support. So the canine is one of the most important uh, tooth for occlusion, uh, basically canine guided occlusion. And also uh, the prominence of the root of the canine, okay, helps in supporting the soft tissue in the, in the angle of the mouth. Uh, so that's very important. So positioning the canine into the right place uh, would have aesthetic consideration. Also, it would, it would be great if the canine lies within the cancellous bone so that it can survive uh, the duration of the time that it is meant for. Now, minus seven degree torque can be got from a premolar bracket also. Also, you have high torque canine brackets which come with plus seven, and if you invert them, they become minus seven. So here in this case, uh, we used a plus seven bracket and inverted it. 
Now we also have to uh, have to understand that whenever you are placing a rectangular arch wire in a rectangular slot, the, uh, your your torque is supposed to express. But uh, most of the arch wires that we use is a 1925 arch wire. Okay, we mostly rarely use 2125 arch wire. So there is a lot of torque slop uh, associated when we place it in an O22 uh, bracket system. So many a times you will find that whenever you are placing uh, a minus seven degree uh, torque bracket and you are putting a 1925 or, uh, wire in that slot, you are not getting good amount of, uh, of canine prominence, uh, canine root prominence. And now, uh, if in this case, it really did not happen. So we were lucky, but uh, if you don't find it, okay, then you have to use auxiliary mechanics like a tan torquing auxiliary uh, in order to get uh, the roots further out uh, close to the buccal cortical plate. So uh, the wire bending is never going to leave you. <laughs> you need to use wire bending if your bracket wire interactions doesn't express well, just because of the slop in the, uh, in the bracket system. Now, what is the bracket system that we use? We use a passive cell ligation system with a torque value of plus 14 in the upper plus six. Uh, uh, that's a standard torque bracket. Why did you use standard torque? Because it is a non-extraction case and we really don't want to flare the insides much. Uh, we don't want to spoil the profile. We also use a plus seven degree bracket in the canine, but we inverted it when we placed it in the uh, uh, when uh, in the in the canine, so that you uh, you have the roots uh, which are coming out more buckly. So that's what we did uh, in the maxillary arch. So we had a standard dog bracket. We don't don't want to flare the incisors. We also had uh, the minus seven degree uh, torque canine uh, brackets when we inverted the plus seven. So that's torque consideration becomes very, very important. We also uh, did mention you previously that you really don't want to place a rectangular arch wire in a rectangular slot when the canine is very close to the root of the lateral and the central. That's very, uh, that's one thing which you need to remember. So when we did in the lower arch, it was all very simple because we used the standard torque uh, system because we just want to close the space. We did not plan to correct the transmigrated canine. We're going to tell you why we did not plan. Now, what is our wire sequencing? It's 016 NITA, which is for 45 days, 18 SS for 280 days, because that's my primary working archway in this case, followed by a 1925 for 30 days and then 1925 SS for 60 days before we settle it uh, out with a very thin wire. Uh, so, and in the lower arch, it was 016 uh, NITA, 18 SS, 1925 NITA, and then mostly 1925 SS. So uh, how did the treatment progress? Uh, no, we banded, uh, we never bonded the lower arch initially. Uh, we, uh, we used uh, the bracket uh, the system, which is a low torque bracket system. Uh, it's self ligation system with open gates in order to accommodate the auxiliary mechanics because you'll never be able to close the gates if you're using it. Uh, the purpose of using self ligation in this case was basically the oral hygiene and, uh, uh, the, and the use of variable torque uh, brackets. Now, uh, the base hardware here is a 18 SS uh, hardware. Now, uh, the, what method did we use to expose the canine? Uh, we used uh, an open window method. If you want to know more about uh, eruption, uh, open eruption, closed eruption, you should go through this article by Burden, which came out in the Journal of American Journal of Orthodontics in 1999. Now, what did we do in this case? Once we opened up the canine and exposed the canine, okay, the, what we, it came out, uh, uh, rotated and very close to the root of the lateral and the central incisor. So we placed a tad, we want, have, want to have a distal movement. The two movements that we wanted to do in this case was to derotate the canine and have a distal movement to this canine. So therefore, uh, what we did was we placed a tad, uh, we now have a chain uh, here which has a distal movement and uh, an attachment there in the center, behind the central, okay, which gives uh, a rotation and distal movement to this canine. You also see that there is some amount of uh, anterior bite turbos being placed uh, because this was a deep bite case and we did not want the lower incisors to go and crash uh, against the canine because it's undergoing a lot of movement. So anterior bite turbos were given to give relief to the occlusal pain. Also, uh, the transverse consideration of the arch becomes very important in this case because when you are using auxiliary mechanics, whenever you are going to use a ballista with this one, we really need to expand the archware a bit, otherwise it will have a tendency to go into a cross bite. Now the most important slide of this presentation is probably this one. 
uh, this is an article, okay, which came out in JADA on a review on diagnosis of management of impacted canines. Now, one of the most important uh, aspects of correction of impaction is to get a good periodontal support at the end of the day for the corrected uh, uh, teeth. Now, whenever you're doing palatal impaction, there are a few methods which uh, uh, of exposure which we can follow. One is the closed flap. One is the open eruption, one is the open window eruption, and another one is the tunnel traction. Now, when do you use the closed flap? When the canine is located near the lateral and the central incisors, uh, horizontally positioned and higher in the roof, we really want to have a closed flap technique. Okay. It goes for one to two weeks after surgery, you need to give immediate traction. But the problem with closed flap technique is that you require re-exposure at a later date, probably with a laser. You might have bone necrosis because you are guttering the bone uh, in that area because most of them are intraosseous uh, impactions. Uh, repeat surgeries, uh, the bone failure might be there because you are working in a contaminated environment uh, of blood and saliva. And you will have a bit of extra time because it's a complicated case. Another method is open eruption, which happens in the late mixed dentition state or early permanent dentition state, where there is a lot of potential for the canine to come down automatically into the right place. When the cast teeth is very close to the occlusal plane, okay, you really want to expose it, okay, and allow the eruption of the. It's usually a very fast method, okay, uh, but uh, uh, there are problems associated with it also. Now, the, what are the advantages? It is improved bone levels, little or no root resorption. Uh, fewer exposure, shorter treatment time, uh, and less operating time, improved oral hygiene, uh, because it's basically a simpler form of impaction. The failure to erupt, uh, basically, since you're not guiding them uh, by active mechanics, okay, you know, so uh, failure to erupt uh, it may extend uh, the treatment time uh, and unable to influence the path of eruption in some cases. But the one which we used in this case is the open window eruption, one of the commonest methods to be used. Uh, and so that is, when do we use it? Is can I look at it near the lateral and the central incisors, horizontally positioned and higher in the roof of the mouth? One to two weeks after removal of the pack is uh, when you want to give a traction. Visualization of the crown is excellent. And once the visualization is there, you have better control over the direction and you can use anti lot of mechanics uh, associated with it. Avoidance of moving the impacted canine into the roots of the adjacent teeth is also very high because you're able to see the canine. Uh, what are the problems? Gingiva overgrowth at the insertion site uh, that may happen. Gingiva is subjected to infection. Uh, basically, if your patient is maintaining good oral hygiene, you really don't have these problems. There's another method which is there, which is called as the tunnel traction. Uh, when you have the primary canine in place in the arch, then you use a tunnel traction. The suture is removed 10 days after the surgery and the traction phase begins. Uh, what are the advantages? Reduce amount of bone around the impacted uh, uh, the canine. The permanent canine is guided into the socket of the, uh, the, of the primary canine. Uh, requires presence of the primary canine because you need a reference. So the, one of the most commonest method, the two common methods which we regularly use in complex cases is basically the closed flap and the open window eruption. So this is something which we all postgraduate need to mug up. Uh, th this, can, uh, this is a gist of all the exposures that would happen uh, uh, that uh, uh, usually needs to be done in case of a palatally impacted canine. How did the treatment progress in this case? Okay, and, uh, we are still not bracketed the lower. We are bringing the one three into place. Uh, our, our base archway is one eight SS, and uh, our auxiliary archway for using an inverted loop mechanics in two three uh, is uh, zero one four SS AJ Wilcox special plus archway. Now. If you want to know about auxiliary mechanics, the best and the landmark article comes from Jacobi, the ballista spring system for impacted teeth uh, in ADODO 1979. That's way back. Okay, uh, so uh, they were all genius uh, who actually uh, uh, made systems which are even today, uh, after 50 years, equally popular. Now, how did we go ahead? And now, we, uh, when we have had a distal movement to this canine, okay, uh, we remove the mini screw because the purpose of the mini screw is done. That was to relieve the, the canine uh, crown from the root of the lateral incisors. Open window method was used. Modified ballista is being used, which would give a downward and a outward movement. Now, whenever you are using a ballista, the problem is that, okay, it has a constricting effect in the upper arch. Uh, there, so either you can use a transparental arch uh, in the molars, uh, which becomes a great advantage, 
you want don't want to use a transparent arch you can use an expanded arch wire and observe uh, if something uh, uh, the mechanics uh, is if the mechanics is working well if you are getting a bit of constriction then you can obviously place a transparent arch at a later date however this was not happening in this case and we opted out of the transparent arch and then we used only an expanded arch wire. so if you want to know more about panel impacted canines uh, the, this is the article by burden which again came out in 1999 okay so you can go through this article so when we finish the case we need to analyze it well first of all the midlines were perfectly on uh, the, the smiley cities is great the deep bite which was 100% is perfect at the end of the treatment if you see uh, uh, we can understand there is perfect alignment of teeth there is deep crowding there is deep bite correction uh, which has already happened and uh, uh, we have a class 1 molar and a canine we can see that the lower 4 3 uh, we have not corrected the transpose teeth but has put a crown on the deciduous teeth just because the root of the deciduous teeth was sufficient and it was gradual wear and tear of the crown uh, was happening so therefore we placed uh, the, uh, uh, all ceramic crown so that it does not wear any further because we are very sure that with such a long root length of the deciduous canine it's going to stay for long on the left hand side we had de impacted the canine but the most important thing you see in both the de impacted canines on either side is that you have a good prominence of the root uh, of the canine which is which is uh, the key uh, to uh, to the success of uh, of these corrected canine impaction cases if you have a good buccal uh, root torque uh, of a palatally impacted canine you have done justice uh, uh, to uh, to this to the case now uh, when we uh, saw the occlusal aspects we found out that the impaction of the canine with good periodontal support you can see that good amount of attached gingiva, gingiva in and around the, the canine region uh, and uh, we decrowded the lower arch uh, and since 37 was uh, was absent okay we plan to uh, put an implant in that case because the 38 was also missing so what is the final result the final result is that we got a, a, a pleasing uh, profile and a perfect smile aesthetics at the end of the treatment with the correction of deep overbite and bringing both the canines into line and we looked at the 45 degree view we see uh, there is a good uh, smiley city is also and the profile remained the same at the end of the treatment because you really don't want to change up already existing good profile so it was orthogonal at the end of the treatment and we looked at the opg it looks uh, very very promising because you can see that the both palatally impacted canines are now straight upright okay uh, they have all uh, been brought no root resorption at all uh, one thing we note in this case is that we have not corrected the transmigrated canine which is lying at the, the lower border of the mandible uh, we have in fact put a crown on the on the, on the deciduous canine which is having good root support now the next question is that uh, uh, should we correct this transmigrated canine or not because the upper arch we have done justice okay the lower arch we have a doubt whether the this transmigrated canine should be corrected or not the 37 was missing and uh, therefore we planned uh, and put an implant in the 37 region because if there was a 38 we would try to upright them and bring them into line and give her a prosthetic free uh, mouth but that was not possible because the 38 was also missing now the the question arises whether to correct this transmigration or not uh, it is not about clinical uh, the clinical perspectives but it is based on uh, the pure science if you go through this article by Sanchez uh, which and Maria, which came out uh, uh, in the in the British Journal of Maxofacial Surgery on transmigration of mandibular cuspids, review of published reports and description of a few cases, they talk about uh, a Muparapu index uh, or a pattern uh, of mandibular canine. And we need to know as orthodont is very precisely about this. What is type one? The mandibular canine is positioned mesioangularly across the midline with the jaw bone, labial and lingual to the anterior teeth, and with the crown of the tooth crossing the midline. Now you, you are getting transmigration, but it is mesioangularly impacted. So this is a, a favorable situation where an orthosurgical intervention is going to give you decent result. But if you see type two, which is horizontally impacted near the inferior border of the mandible below the apices of the incisors, that does not give great results only because when you try to move such deep-seated impaction which is in the lower border of the mandible 
okay, and the type of the movement that you need to get one, there is chances of it going and hitting the root of the uh, of the lower incisors. Also, when it travels such a huge distance uh, from one side of the arch to other, the amount of periodontal support that you get in most cases is not sufficient. So the prognosis of type two is uh, the poor. Type three erupting either mesial or distal to the opposite canine. So that's very close uh, uh, to the opposite canine, which is practically not possible to be corrected. Type four is horizontally impacted with the inferior border of the mandible below the epicenter of the premolar of the molar on the opposite side. So that's also not possible to be corrected. So type two, three, and four are unfavorable. Type five, you can give a try, okay? Uh, because it's positioned vertically in the midline along the axis of the uh, tooth crossing the midline despite the state of uh, eruption. So type one and type five are triable, type one is favorable. But in this case, it was about, uh, you know, uh, it's type two and three region, okay. So uh, we opted out of it because we don't found, didn't found, find it practical. However, you need to extract that canine because they may change into a cyst uh, at a later date. Uh, so extraction of the canine was indicated, uh, indicated and advised to this patient. Now, if you go through one more article which came out by Domenico and Simon Parini on impacted and transmigrated mandibular canine incidence, etiology and treatment, uh, the, it uh, uh, gave us few, uh, uh, few important information. 89, according to this uh, systematic review, 89% of all transmigrated canine goes for inevitably for surgical extraction. Of the 11% that was even tried, almost 17, 18% went for failures. So the percentage of success is very less. Uh, in uh, type uh, two, three, and four, uh, that's what they are concerned about. Type one, definitely you should give a try. Horizontal position of transmigrated canine in the lower border of the mandible, which have crossed the midline, have poorest prognosis. And type one variety of transmigrated canine, which have mesoangular uh, angularly placed, have the best prognosis, call for orthosurgical intervention. Uh, rest all varieties have questionable prognosis. So. Uh, when we go through these articles, okay, you have to understand that the, the, the one which we had in this case was very, very unfavorable. And hence we opted to extract that canine and not correct it. So when we go uh, post-treatment, when we saw into the cephalometry, okay, we found out that the profile remains as good as ever. Okay. Uh, and the parameters showed that still the patient has a class three skeletal pattern. The IMP uh, improved because there were the correction of spacing uh, was done by retraction. Overbite uh, was perfectly corrected. Uh, uh, torque in the upper incisors were good. Uh, the FMA remained almost close uh, uh, to uh, horizontal uh, growth pattern, which was initially there. So how did we progress with the treatment? We targeted both the canines in the apparatus. One was very complicated and one was uh, pretty, uh, pretty okay. So we started uh, uh, with uh, uh, treating the upper arch only with low torque brackets and went ahead uh, uh, with uh, open uh, window eruption uh, and used tabs to dislice them and then corrected uh, them by downward and outward movement with a ballista spring and got a perfect uh, uh, positioning of the canine at the end of the treatment. So uh, pre and post treatment com comparison shows that uh, she had uh, uh, the good balanced uh, the facial contours at the end of the treatment. She had greatly improved uh, smile aesthetics at the end of the treatment once the canine uh, were brought into line and it was adequately talked, which gave good uh, support to the soft tissue uh, the, uh, in the angle of the mouth. So uh, we also had a pleasing uh, smile at the end of the treatment in the 45 degree view. The profile remained almost the same and it was uh, as good as before. Now, uh, if you want to know more about impacted canines, and one thing which we didn't discuss in this case is the use of auxiliaries to, to correct the torque of the, of the canines of palatally impact, uh, corrected palatally impacted canines. You can go through this article where we talk about the tan torquing auxiliary, okay? uh, where uh, bracket wire interaction was not sufficient enough to correct, give a good torque to the, uh, to the canine uh, after uh, the correction of palatal impaction. Uh, probably, uh, if you can go through this article, it's fine. Otherwise, we'll uh, we'll show you in one of the presentations uh, later on. The biomechanics and perspectives of palatal canine impaction is uh, very very important. You want to uh, the article is quoted as orthodontic management of class one crowding malocclusion uh, with palatally impacted canines. The Journal of Indian Orthodontic Society in 2017, written by us. 
if you feel that uh, the, all the the clinical informations that we are giving over, over to you is uh, is good enough okay do subscribe to this uh, channel and keep in touch with us in this mode we are loving this mode of interacting with you uh, the, in the in the digital forum uh, if you have any doubts please uh, clarify your doubts because uh, only uh, when you ask your doubts do we uh, do both of us learn uh, I'm open to all questions and criticism because it only helps us improve uh, with all the information that you guys provide uh, provided us over the years. You can always contact in this number. We want uh, we always upload uh, recent cases in Instagram. You can uh, scan the QR code and uh, and and follow us on Instagram also. It's time uh, that we uh, uh, come back uh, to normal life, being staying positive, and time to rebuild. Thank you uh, for listening to this uh, uh, lecture one more uh, time. Uh, it's lovely to keep in touch with you guys. Thank you once more for a patient listening.